Hi, welcome to the Beckett Cook Show. I'm Beckett Cook, and this is actually the very first episode of my show. And I, the reason I want to do this show is because uh, before I became a Christian 11 years ago, I lived in the dark and I didn't know the truth. And I believed pretty much almost all the lies of the world. I just believed them. Um, and I lived in, I lived in Los Angeles. That's where I am today in my home in Los Angeles. And I just bought the lies of the world. And so after I became a Christian, everything in my life changed, including my sexual identity. Um, but all my, my affections changed, which is the name of my book, a change of affection, but all of my desires changed. All of my goals changed. Everything changed in my life in a split second. And and I also suddenly knew the truth about life, that there was objective reality, that there was, that God did exist. And so, and that Jesus was a son and that he died on the cross for my, my sins and that I was saved. And that was an objective reality and it is an objective reality. And so I want to, my, the main goal of the show is to dispel the myths and the the lies and the falsehoods of the culture and look at the truth behind those lies. So I really want to focus on culture because I don't, I'm not going to get into politics because I think other people do that way better than I can do. I, but I, I just want to focus on culture. And that's one of the things, one of the, uh, the main resources for my kind of topics or ideas is the New York Times. <laughs> because I mean, I, I read the New York Times every day because I'm a masochist. But, you know, before I was a Christian, I read the New York Times every day. I completely believed it. I believed the op-ed pieces in the New York Times. I, I mean, I read the New Yorker every week. And that was kind of my mindset. I mean, I, I was a secular humanist and I believed all of that. So um, one of the, the, the first topic I want to talk about today, which is kind of a big one, is the existence of God and how as Christians we can not only know that God exists, but know that we know God exists. And we'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. But I want to point to an article. It was an op-ed in the New York Times. This came out in March of 2016, March 26th. And it was Easter weekend. And so uh, it was, it's by a guy named William Irwin. And the, the title of the op-ed piece is God is a question, not an answer. And that, that title intrigued me because after becoming a Christian, I knew that the, even just from the title that the article was false and had uh, just falsehoods in it. And so I just want to read a few um, excerpts from the article and, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. So in, in this piece, William Irwin says, the question is permanent. Answers are temporary. I live in the question. So when talking about the existence of God, he's saying that he lives in the question. He never really has an answer. And this is interesting because this is kind of the, the way it works in, in, in our culture, in our world, and especially in Los Angeles, where I live. It's, it's like people kind of respect you if you're seeking after truth. But once you find the truth, then suddenly they don't like that. They don't like people claiming truth. Um, and so that that's where this guy, William Irwin, he, he likes to live in the question, which um, I don't know. If, I guess that's fun for him to do that. But um, and then he goes on to say, dwelling in a state of doubt, uncertainty and openness about the existence of God marks an honest approach to the question. So again, he wants, he, he likes to be in the state of doubt, which that's not biblical Christianity, to be in a constant state of doubt. That's not, that's not how it works. And so I, I want to 
We'll get to that in a minute, but I want to continue just kind of going through a, a few more of his excerpts. Um, he says, he says the, the idea that God exists, the, he says the question may be fundamentally unanswerable. And that is a lie, complete lie, which we'll get to. He says, likewise, anyone who does not occasionally worry that she is wrong about the existence or non-existence of God most likely has a fraudulent belief. And so what he's saying here is if, if you're not, if you have any uncertainty or if you're certain that, if you're certain that God exists, then it's a fraudulent belief. It's uh, somehow it's 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 a false belief. Um, so that uh, that's a that's kind of a crazy assertion to make, um, and we'll 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 address that in a minute too. But he says, and then he goes on to say, people who claim certainty about God worry me. So he's worried <laughs> he's worried about people who claim to know God and to be to have no doubt that God exists. Uh, and then a, a couple more things he says is there should be no dogmatic belief. The believer could, should concede that she does not know with certainty that God exists. There is no faith without doubt. So let's, that statement alone, there is no faith without doubt is completely erroneous. You can have faith. Christian faith, you can have faith in the God of the universe, the God of the Bible, and not have doubt. And th there's a very specific reason you can do that. Uh, and then he goes on to say, belief without doubt would not be required by an all-loving God, and it should not be worn as a badge of honor. So he's, he's basically saying you shouldn't be confident as a Christian. You should not be confident that God exists. Uh, that there's something wrong with you if you are confident about that. And so uh, he says, um, the final thing I'll, I'll just say that he says is, what is important is the common ground of the question, not the answer, not an answer. And so again, he, he wants to live in that, that question. And, you know, I have to say before, God crashed into my life 11 years ago. I genuinely believe, growing up, I genuine, genuinely believed that if I were to ever become a Christian, which, I, which was not even an option for me because I was gay until God redeemed that and, and I no longer identify as gay. Um, but I believed that even if I were to become a Christian, it would just be kind of a leap in the dark. I, I I thought there was there would actually be no way to really know that that it was true. I would just be kind of guessing, and boy was I wrong. So um, I want to get into the 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 concept of knowledge, epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. Um, and there's a definite, I found this definition of epistemology that is interesting because it, it really applies to what we're going to talk about today. It says epistemology is the investigation of what distinguishes justified belief from opinion. So it's like the epistemology is basically facts from opinion uh, that we can, how we, how we know things and how we can know that we know things. So the, this is very important because Christians can know that the claims of the of Christianity are true and we don't have to just guess. And there's two reasons why this is important. Knowledge gives someone uh, knowledge gives someone uh, the ability to act in with authority in public. So for example, if my neighbor who, you know, is a movie producer comes over and puts his hands in my mouth with a drill. I'm not going to be okay with that. But if my dentist does that, I'm going to be totally fine with that because he, my, my dentist has the authority to act in public. He's certified. He has the, the, the relevant body of knowledge to actually 
work in my mouth and pull teeth or whatever, or give you know, fill cavities, which I've weirdly never had a cavity. Um, so that is important because um, and if Christianity is actually a source of knowledge, then it should give us the authority to speak to issues from a base of knowledge. So the world, Satan and the culture tells us that, you know, pastors don't really have knowledge. They just have, they just have faith claims and no one can really tell if they're right or wrong. So that, that's, that's kind of what the culture tells us that, yeah, those, those religious people have these faith claims, but you, you don't really know, you know, what's true or not true. And maybe all roads lead to heaven. It doesn't matter what faith you're in, but that's false. And so the second reason why it matters that um, we, we can actually know that the central claims of Christianity are true is that it gives, that knowledge gives you a tremendous confidence in what you believe. So you can believe that there's life after death. Um, so when I, before I was a Christian, I didn't know, I didn't know anything. I didn't know where I came from, what I was doing here, where I was going. But once I, once God saved me and put his Holy Spirit in me, I knew exactly where I came from, what I'm doing here, what happens to me after I die. I know exactly what happens. So I used to be, you know, afraid of death. Uh, when I would get on airplanes, especially airplanes, um, obviously, and there was turbulence, I, I would be very fearful because I was afraid of death. And now when I, when I get on a plane, I have zero fear. Obviously, if a plane goes down, it's not really fun. <laughs> but I have zero fear of death, like absolutely none. And that's what this knowledge gives you is you have no fear of death. And um, so it's important that we we understand that we, we understand that this knowledge gives us confidence. And this knowledge uh, gives us uh, the authority to act in public. And so let's talk about knowledge. What is knowledge? Um, what is, what are the three kinds of knowledge? Um, I want to focus on one kind of knowledge for, for these purposes today, but the, just briefly, the three kinds of knowledge is number one, knowledge by acquaintance or direct experience. So I can know that the clock, there's a clock on the wall by seeing it right now. I may not even know that it is a clock. I may not know what the object is, but I can see that there's a round object with numbers on it and a couple of hands on it. So I, that's knowledge by direct, ex, by acquaintance or direct experience. I can experience that clock right now. Um, the second kind of knowledge is propositional truth. And that's a true belief based on adequate grounds. So propositional truth would be like believing that George Washington existed. Uh, there, there's adequate grounds to believe that. There's documents, there's, there's you know, multiple witnesses of his existence, there's books about him, there's letters from him. There's, so uh, it's, it's pretty, there's enough historical evidence that he existed. So that's adequate grounds for me to believe that George Washington existed. So that's proposition, propositional truth. The last kind of knowledge is know-how or skill. And this is the ability to, ability to do something well. This can also be um, kind of biblically, this can be understood as wisdom. So, but I'm gonna focus on the first kind of knowledge, which is knowledge by acquaintance or direct experience. Um, and when, when we talk about that, we have to go to the new birth In Christianity is called born again or the new birth. And that's what, ha that's what takes place when someone goes from a non-believer to a believer. And the, it's interesting because the term born again, Christian is, I always, I always laugh when people use that term because it's it's funny because it's redundant because there's no there's no such thing as a christian unless you've been born again 
And I'll just, just to prove that right now, just, uh, I'm going to turn to John, uh, the gospel of John chapter three. And Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, the famous Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a Pharisee and he was the ruler of the Jews, as it says. And he comes to Jesus at night and he says, Rabbi, we know you are our teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus recognizes that there's something special about Jesus because he's doing all these signs and miracles and he's interested. He's, he wants to know who this guy is. And so Jesus is funny because he, he never, he doesn't respond to his question. He just immediately launches into truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus responds, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb, womb and be born? And Jesus, again, just reiterates, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. And what does that mean? Um, Paul, Paul, actually, let's go to Romans chapter 8, because Paul does an exposition on the new birth in a very clear way in Romans chapter eight, verses nine through 11. The apostle Paul says, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. If the spirit of, of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So in other words, Paul is saying, if the Holy Spirit does not dwell in you, you don't belong to Christ. You're not a Christian. You're not an, a true believer. And the new birth is a very specific moment in time. And it hap it's a supernatural moment. It's from God. It's born. It's being born from above. That's an, another translation of born again, born from above. And it happens in a split second. And again, it's, a, it's, it's God's doing. It's a supernatural act of God. Uh, you can't, a human being cannot sort of just try his hardest to to become born again it has to be from god he does that it's a gift from god and at, and in that moment of being born again god puts his spirit in you so the holy spirit is in me right now the the same as paul said the same spirit who raised jesus from the dead is <laughs> is in me which is kind of remarkable and and amazing and when that happens when the new birth happens you, everything, as I said, everything changes. Your eyes are open. So we're all born blind. We're, every human being is born blind. And I think that's why Jesus heals so many blind people in the Gospels is because we're all spiritually blind at birth. And when you're born again, you gain sight for the first time and you can actually see the truth for the first time. And that's what happened to me. I, it was like, the scales fell from my eyes and I could see reality for the first time in my life. It's almost like if someone is born physically blind, like actually blind, that's their whole kind of world. But if they're healed later in life, it becomes clear, literally clear, what everything actually really is and what the, what the world really looks like. And that's the same thing spiritually. It's once you become born again and you, you're given your sight, you can see reality for what it really is for the first time. And, and when, I, when that happened to me, it blew my mind when I could see the truth for the first time. Because, I mean, I lived in a postmodern world where everything was subjective. I believed everything was subjective and that nobody really knew the truth and no one i didn't really know what was right or wrong or up or down or you know black or white it's just but after i became a christian i knew what objective truth was and that it was that jesus christ was the truth the way and the life and so that that's a huge <clears throat> that's a huge thing that happens at the, at the new birth
<clears throat> excuse me. And so what this does is um, it gives us confidence. The new birth gives us confidence that we, I mean, it gives us confidence that we know God. And you can line up, let's, let's just do a little experiment. If you lined up 100 born again Christians and you ask them what, ha what happened in that when you were born again, what happened when you were saved? What, what, tell us, describe that moment, describe that experience. They would all essentially say the same thing. I mean, they would basically say, I was in the dark. And then I came into the light. I was lost and now I'm found. Uh, they would say, you know, my life was this way before and it radically changed and became uh, completely different after. And that is empirical evidence because if, I mean, it's like the, you know, the, the testimonies on I am second or any testimonies really, my testimony, um, if all of those testimonies you you see and you watch are essentially the same, it's it's like this is I used to kind of be a mess and live this way, or I used to be super you know fake religious and live this way, and now I I truly my life is truly changed and my uh, everything has changed and I I you know I the Bible is is true to me. Uh, the word of God is real. God's existence is real. I mean, for me, personally, for me, and I, I would say this uh, for anyone who's born again, the existence of God is, is like the existence of this glass of water. Like I know this glass of water exists because I can experience it directly. I have direct experience with it, which is to me, God is just as real as this glass of water. Like there's no difference. I can, I can sense him. And actually I'll tell you a couple of, maybe I'll tell you a story about a couple things. Well, one thing I'll tell you about, um, that happened at, I mean, at my conversion, when I became a Christian 11 years ago, God, I mean, it was so abundantly clear. It was like a road to Damascus kind of encounter with God. And it was so clear who God was and that Jesus was his son and that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And, and that I had, I was, I had eternal life suddenly and that I was adopted into the kingdom of God. It was just absolutely clear. It happened actually twice in the same day. God just showed me so much in, in the same day. The, the story I wanted to tell you is I, this is just one of, a, of many, many, stories of, of a direct experience with God that I've had over the last 11 years. I was at my church in Hollywood and I was, after the sermon, there's a time of worship for like 30 minutes. And I, during that worship time, I usually just kind of go up to the front of the church and pray. And so I was just praying and the worship music was playing and I had never done this before. I've never done it since. And I knew that there was a friend of mine in the congregation that day. I saw him across the room. And mind you, there were a thousand people in the congregation that morning. And I knew that Nick was there and he's one of the elders in my church. And um, so I, I, was, I was praying in the front of the church and I just, I just prayed this prayer. I'm like, God, will you send Nick over here to pray for me? I just, I need prayer right now. I'm not, I feel kind of run down. I had a bad weekend and whatever. I, I just said, God, will you send Nick over to pray for me? That's all I said. <laughs> Five minutes later, I feel a hand on my shoulder and I look up and it's Nick. And I'm like, what you talking about, Willis? Uh, and I said, what, Nick, I said, what do you, I just prayed that God would send you over here to pray for me. And he said, yeah, the Lord just told me to come pray for you. And I'm like, whoa. And so that's just one of many, many examples of how God, God, he, he's a relational God. He's a personal God. It's a personal relationship that we have. And 
Um, and that day, he just wanted to encourage me and say, hey, I'm hearing you. I hear your prayers. And and so that was that's mind blowing. And it's, it's happened. So many of those kinds of things have happened. And so the point of the article that William Irwin wrote, the, that God is a question, not an answer. It's, it's just another lie. It's another falsehood from the culture. And again, I don't blame William Irwin because I, he's, he's living in the dark. He hasn't been born again, clearly. And he's in the dark. So he's writing from a place of, of, from, of being in the dark. And, and I, I used to do the same thing all the time. I would write screenplays and, and uh, TV scripts and all kinds of things. <clears throat> and they were written from my secular humanist worldview. But now my worldview has radically shifted to a biblical worldview because God showed me so clearly who he was. And <clears throat> that's why it's important that not only that we can know God, which is, is true, which is a fact, but the idea that we can know that we know God. And what, what I mean by that is, let's say two, two college students have a final exam. Both of them have studied, prepared super well, so they both have the knowledge of, of what's on that test. They both have the answers. But maybe one of the guys is has a low self image, or he's anxious, or he's he's uh, he has problems with you know anxiety or whatever. So he doesn't really know that he knows the answers to the test, even though he has the knowledge. He doesn't know that he knows. But the other guy is confident that he knows that he knows the not the the answers to the test. So that's why it's important as Christians. When people tell you, if you're a Christian and people tell you, oh, you can't really know that God exists. You, you can't make those claims. It's like, no, actually I can. This is, this is a form, this is a, this is a form of knowledge, a knowledge by direct experience or acquaintance. And I have that knowledge from my direct experience with God and my acquaintance with God. So, so the William Irwins of the world can tell you all day long that you can't know God and that there it's actually impossible to know God, but that is a lie. And I hope, I hope that this helps you as a Christian. I hope this helps you just navigate when you're talking to people in the world and they, they ask you these questions and they, they have, you know, these strong objections to your faith claims. Um, because again, it's not, we're not just, it's not a leap in the dark to be a Christian, it, to be a genuine Christian is not a leap in the dark. It's not some just kind of like, oh, I guess, I, I guess this is real. Maybe I'll just go with it. Cause my, you know, I grew up sort of this way. No, no, no. It's a actual, uh, it's based on real knowledge based on absolute truth. And so, um, I hope this helps. And I hope um, that we can keep exploring all kinds of, there's so many, I mean, if I, <laughs> if I just look at the New York Times right now, I mean, I could do 20 episodes from just today's paper, um, which I'm not gonna do right now, but um, I hope you, uh, you enjoyed this episode. And so like it, share it, subscribe, and I hope to see you next time on the new Becca Cook Show. Thank you for watching.